And I think, you know, I think that really sets up our conversation now to move into what we frequently refer to as a second line setting, the patients that have been previously treated now with metastatic renal cell carcinoma on, uh, on, a, on a primary therapy that's typically now, as you've heard from, from multiple people, a VEGF-targeted TKI. It could be high dose IL-2, it could be an mTOR inhibitor, but that's the bulk of our patients now. In thinking about now this previously treated population, the second line setting, we have some clinical trial data that can guide us. Um, uh, Brian, do you want to walk us through the AXIS study, which looked at one of the novel agents, axitinib, uh, we talked about a little bit earlier, uh, this study that uh, was a pivotal trial uh, evaluating axitinib in the second line space. Sure. So the AXIS trial um, really was born from, you know, we had a lot of, at first, retrospective and then uh, small prospective trials saying that VEGF therapy retains activity when given in sequence. Uh, that the disease remains VEGF responsive through two, three, or, or beyond lines of treatment. Um, by the uh, time that axitinib was developed, there were already several approved drugs, Sunit and, and Serafinib chief among them. Uh, what was distinguishing about axitinib was its biochemical profile being more targeted towards VEGF and more biochemically potent compared to, say, Serafinib, which is less potent and more uh, broadly inhibitory against other uh, kinases. So the AXIS trial randomized patients who had received one and only one prior therapy to either axitinib or serafinib, in essence comparing more potent second-line VEGF inhibition with less potent second-line VEGF inhibition. That'd be one way to think about it. What was uh, unique about the trial was that it wasn't uh, just sunitinib refractory. It was meant to sort of reflect global practice. So prior cytokines were allowed, prior sunitinib, uh, prior temsorolimus, or prior bevacizumab. And those were the four regimens approved at the time the trial was designed. Pazopinib had not yet been approved, and neither had Everolimus. Mm -hmm. So they came along a bit later in terms of the, the timelines. What the trial showed was uh, an advantage to axitinib in that setting, hazard ratio of 0 0.67, and about a two-month difference in the median, 4.7 versus 6.7 months. It was the trial that led to the regulatory approval uh, of axitinib in this setting. So again, it was really, you know, the, the trial served as a mechanism, certainly for drug approval, to get what was felt to be a efficacious and tolerable agent into the clinic. We mentioned sort of the, the frontline uh, data and the challenges. Um, and for, for us in our clinical practice tends to be the, the second line drug of choice. So uh, Brian, um, were there populations of patients that, you, that were better off getting exitinib, for example, uh, to be a bit provocative, those that, those that had better outcomes in the frontline setting, did they do better with, with exitinib? And, and do you, do you think about that when you apply the use of exitinib to the patient in the second line? Yeah, so it's a challenging question, which is I know why you asked it. Um, so I guess I would back up and say is that about a third of patients got cytokines in the frontline setting, um, high dose IL-2 and then low dose cytokines in, in Asia. Um, those patients clearly did the best, and you would imagine that, right? They're, they're VEGF naive. Right. They, right. They're treatment refractory, but they're VEGF naive. They're going to have the best responses for both drugs. Now, that, those patients don't exist much, certainly here in the U.S., maybe your high dose IL-2 failures. Um, in terms of prior therapy characteristics impacting response to second-line therapy, I honestly think we don't know the answer. I, I'm not convinced that there are characteristics of frontline response that enable you to choose a second-line agent. We all do it in practice, and we feel better giving another VEGF agent to somebody who's had a three-year response compared to a three-month duration. But if you look at the data, um, it, personally, I'm not convinced that, that the data supports doing that. It makes me feel better because I think, oh, they did so well and they'll do well on this drug, or they did so poorly, I want to switch mechanisms. But I'm not, I'm not yet convinced that the data so, supports so that. So me, let me push you a little bit. Please. So, <laughs> so we're left with, and this is, the, this is a conundrum that we have in, the, in practice. We, we have high-level evidence of Everolimus in the second-line setting after sunitinib prior treatment, and we have high-level evidence of exitinib, and they've never been compared head-to-head. -head. So what are the characteristics of how you practice when choosing between those two high-level evidence options for your patients? So, so I'm obviously biased because I've been involved with exitinib's development, but um, I would say a couple things. So, so only 21% of the record one patients were truly second-line for Everolimus. So it was largely a third and fourth line study. So to practice evidence-based medicine, exitinib was given in a pure second line setting. 
In terms of level of evidence, it would be exitinib first and then everolimus in that, you know, in that setting. Um, but again, it, it, they've never been compared and, and probably never will be. Um, I also look, and I know we're going to talk about Tom's trial of Temsorolimus versus serafinib second line, which was, you know, uh, mTOR versus VEGA. Now, again, it's not maybe our best mTOR and our best VEGA, but at least in principle, I think it addresses that. And I don't know if we want to turn to that now, but I, I think about that because I'm a believer that kidney cancer is VEGF driven and remains VEGF driven, at least through the first two lines of therapy for the majority of patients. There are data, as you're aware, about uh, mutations in TOR pathway in some kidney cancer patients. I think it's a relatively small percentage, but ideally that would be a great way to select out what I think is a fairly small fraction of patients that benefit from those drugs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to what you brought up, what actually what Bob brought up and you addressed somewhat, and that is the response to tyrosine kinase inhibitor in the frontline setting. Because I, I think for the practitioner, this is going to be somewhat self-fulfilling. We know that the patient that has a very short response to a TKI in the frontline setting has a very poor prognosis. It almost doesn't matter what you're going to put them on. Your anecdotal experience is not going to be a positive one. Whereas if you've got a patient that had a really long response to a TKI in that frontline setting, that's a much better overall prognosis, and you're more likely to see a good effect uh, with, with a second-line agent in that setting. So I, I think we have to be a little bit careful in how we, at least on our own individual practice patterns, learn from you know, what, what we should do. And I, I think it's, to me, it's one of our unmet needs still in recognizing these patients that have relatively short responses to frontline VEGF TKI, we need better therapies. Maybe that's where some combination approaches could actually fit in. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, patients who have primary refractory disease to upfront VEGF TKI, maybe 15 to 20 percent of patients, are going to do poorly no matter what. And they should be referred for clinical trials, treated aggressively, you know, pull out all the stops because those patients are not going to do well on any drug in VEGF versus mTOR. I don't think it matters in that setting. Um, for the luckily the majority of patients who aren't in that, um, then I, you know, I sort of use what I, I mentioned sort of to make decisions. But there is a wide you know, variation in how people interpret the data and practice patterns and obviously timing of when the drugs came along impacts it as well. And I think one of the things we see, I'm sure the, four, the five of us see this, is the patient referred to us that we believe has had inadequate frontline VEGF TKI therapy. Mm -hmm. Inadequate as defined by uh, insufficient dosing, altering schedule, rapid switch to a different drug because of, of thought to be toxicity complications. And, and, I, and I, think off, I think one of the nice things about AXIS is that it continues to reinforce that you don't have to change classes mm -hmm. even if the drugs that were used before were felt to be intolerant. And so let me just, um, I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, so, so reel me in if, if I do. Um, but, you know, I think I cannot completely discount the anecdotal experience I have as an investigator seeing, you know, large numbers of kidney cancer patients. So I'm back in the day when we just had Sutan and Serafinib. I know it sounds like it's historic, but it isn't too long ago. Oftentimes we would cycle between the two drugs, and I think all of us have had patients, although a small minority, who did not respond to one of those agents as frontline and they get the second agent and it works for a long period of time. And I know that now we're starting to look at some differences in how differential activity of the more potent VEGF inhibitors, for instance, in the ECOG performance, that is zero patient, seeming to do very well, the more potent ones, and the more broadly inhibitory kinase inhibitors, such as the serafinib, is doing better in those poor performance status patients, and maybe that that predicts an underlying biology. So I think what we're learning is there's this heterogeneity and I don't think one strategy is going to be able to be employed to all patients. And I don't know, I certainly would ask my colleagues to comment on that, but, you know, experience tells me I can't just say, if you are primary refractor to Sutent, you need mTOR. Because I've certainly given back four or five years ago these patients Nexavar and have these patients on it for three years. So I don't know what's unique about their tumor um, that allows them to be sensitive to that. And maybe we've all had these experiences as we go through first, second, third, fourth, fifth line where you'll see some patients who will blow through a therapy and others have dr dramatic response to things you didn't think would work in them. And, and clearly there's differences in these drugs. I mean, these are not me, me too drugs. They have different pharmacokinetics, different dosing and half-lives, absorption levels, as well as hitting different targets and whatnot that, you're right, we, we can't necessarily measure in our, uh, in our, in our patients today. So I, I think you're absolutely right in, in making those points. And, uh, and I think, you know, it's something we can learn. We do see some patients that get a, a longer response in the second line setting, 
than in the frontline setting. And it, it does kind of raise the question, you know, how different can these drugs you be? You wish almost setting? you had the ability to sample yeah. or you had like a repository where you could really study those patients. Maybe some institutions do, but, but mine does not. I mean, I would just go back to the point that Bob made about making sure patients have really failed their frontline therapy. Yeah. And I know we all see that a lot as uh, in referral centers that, um, you know, if I had a nickel for every radiology report that said progression, where it really wasn't progression. Um, we've, you know, been in meetings where we talk about you know, how long do we treat, and I think uniformly those of us who take care of the disease every day treat beyond resist progression uh, routinely. Um, and there are different kinds of progression in new areas versus increase in existing areas, but that's where, you know, an experience in the disease and with a drug helps you to take care of an individual patient. I, I, I just, I tell patients we want to squeeze every last bit of, of um, benefit out of this drug before we throw it on the scrap heap, even though there are multiple drugs to go to. Um, and so I think if you talk through that with the patient and show them their scans and show them the magnitude of increase and maybe where they started and where they've come from, I think it puts it in perspective, but obviously that's time consuming and requires, you know, an experience with the drugs and the disease. It's the art, the art of medicine. The art of medicine. But, but what